Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation in virtual mode, and it has been for months and months and months, and it may be for months to come. Uh, today, I'm delighted that we have uh, the author of a, I think, really interesting new book, and also somebody who may not entirely agree with the author of that book. We have Alex Brummer, who is uh, the city editor of the Daily Mail, which is a position he's had for now 20 years. Before that, he was the financial editor of The Guardian, which is quite a big ideological leap. And before that was the uh, Washington and financial correspondent of the uh, of the Guardian, um, he has written a book called "The Great British Reboot: um, How the UK uh, Well, how could, how the UK can thrive in a turbulent world." It, it was published by Yale University Press, very respectable publisher, on November the tenth, um, and it's a really interesting book for those who have read some of Alex's previous books. This one is really meaty. It's long, it's got lots and lots of footnotes, and it really, it provides a very, I think, very optimistic uh, vision of the future. Um, it's uh, been called refreshingly, um, it's a refreshingly positive book, inspiring uh, John, by John Kay. Um, it's uh, Thank Goodness for Alex Brummer, David Goodhart. Uh, powerful vision, Vicky Price. The, that, there's a lot. There's a lot in this book to be getting on with. It's um, it's absolutely up to date. It reflects uh, the COVID crisis. It reflects what's been happening in the UK up to, I guess, a couple of months ago. But he won't get everything his own way. Jonathan Portis, professor of public policy at uh, KCL King's College London, uh, uh, will have I surmise different views. He uh, he was started as. Uh, uh, a, an economist at the Treasury, went to, became chief economist at the DWP, the Department of Work and Pensions, chief economist at the Cabinet Office, director of the National Institute, senior fellow at the ECRC, ESRC, and so on and so forth. Uh, first of all, however, I give you Alex Brummer. Tell us about your book. I mean, try and pick out, if you can, the main themes of the book. Yeah. Andrew, thank you very much for organising this, and, and it's very kind of you. Um, um, and I always appreciate what the CSFI does. It's a great organisation. Um, very has all, very good sessions, very authoritative. So it's we always, survive. We survive on the kindness of strangers. No, no. It's um, anyway. Just wanted to make that point. Um, so the genesis of this book, um, as you may imagine, goes right back to the um, Brexit referendum and the outcome of the Brexit referendum in. The summer of 2016, um, um, and so it's, it's been a long time in um, in, in production um, um, because of really the changing scene, the changing background, which has been very fast. Um, it was a kind of follow up, really, to an earlier book, which um, which you, Andrew, I kind of you know, looked at once before, the Britain for Sale book, which was um, some years ago, five or six years ago, um, which looked at how. So much of British industry had been um, many, so many companies in right across the economy had um, had fallen into the hands of foreign buyers. Um, in many cases, in the ones I used in that book, um, um, I thought to look for the worse. Um, there were one, there are, and I think I do deal with this in the, in the new book. There are cases where that foreign ownership has actually been very positive. So you know, I I accept that you know I wasn't entirely right. With the previous book, so there's some there's a bit of ro rowing back from my previous theme, but not not a huge amount, but a bit of rowing back on that. Um, and then, of course, um, it um, while it was in production, um, COVID came along. So we originally hoped to get the book out in the uh, early part of this year, early part of of, of 2020, and um, COVID came along. Um, Co delays on production and COVID and all the rest of it, and um, we eventually pushed it out to this to this autumn. Um, um, I didn't know that the actual day that the book book would be published was the day that the bookshops would be closed, but um, that's just one of those um, small perils which um, which come which comes in your in the direction. So I think um, so. Um, all, so the COVID stuff is a bit of a layer on top of 
what was the main theme, which was how Britain will look after Brexit and how we're going to cope. And so it begins really with a um, fairly standard analysis, analysis, I don't know what, standard narrative really of, of where, the British econ where the economy was um, at the time of Brexit, um, what the, and the changing shape of the world economy and the UK economy, um, and um, tries to assess, you know, um, um, whether we were well placed within the European Union to to take advantage of the changing shape of the global economy. Now, um, I've done one or two of these sessions already, and one of the big criticisms I've had, and this came from one of the chief executives of one of Britain's biggest companies, um, was that um, couldn't we have done all of this from within the European Union? Um, couldn't we have taken advantage of the global economy from within the European Union? We had quite a good, good ding-dong on that particular subject, and um, it's an interesting area of uh, interesting area of argument. Um, I've always argued. My the, the thrust of my argument essentially is that um, actually um, we were blinkered by the European Union in many ways. That um, we'd allowed our policymakers, um, particularly our civil service, I suppose, and Jonathan knows a lot more about that than I do, having worked there, um, to be governed really by the rules of the European Union. Um, um, and um, we were very strict enforcers of those rules in a way that some of the other countries perhaps have not been as strict enforcers. Um, and that, in a sense, has dictated the way government and I think business or some businesses have thought about Europe, that they've seen it as as the main focus of what they're doing. So I just think that, you know, that there's a kind of opening of a vision. And then there were the downsides of what I would call the downsides of the European Union. Um, I'm... Um, I've chronicled fairly rapidly, uh, chronicled over the years, um, sitting in this office um, um, and in the paper and elsewhere, um, the um, problems of the euro area, the euro zone, if you like to call it, um, which you know, which are not just me. I, um, um, you know, Joseph Stiglitz wrote a whole book about this. Um, Mervyn King has been very down on this in many ways. Um, a, a very imperfect monetary union um, in all sorts of ways. And, um, and in a sense, I felt that in some ways we were sitting outside of that monetary union um, um, on, the fr on the fringes, really, um, because we were excluded from the Euro group and there were decisions being made, um, very minor decisions some people might think in terms of the City of London. Um, I can think of two which um, were challenged um, by George Osborne when he was Chancellor. One was over bank bonuses. Um, people might say, you know, thank goodness for that. I, in some, wearing some of my hats in the paper, I would say thank goodness for that. And um, short, um, shorting in the markets, um, short-term um, betting on on stocks and so on, shorting. And those were two areas which were challenged. And these were things which were done in the city and Europe didn't like them very much, um, didn't like quite a lot of what we didn't do like very much. And 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 you begin to feel that there was a sort of a, other areas too um, around asset management. And I think Andrew Bailey um, actually spoke quite eloquently of this on this um, in the summer of, uh, before he took over at the bank uh, when the Woodford crisis erupted. He talked about how he felt, um, or the FCA felt constrained in terms of the way um, some of the um, asset management companies were regulated. These are, so there were some sort of minor clashes um, which indicated you know, that, that this wasn't necessarily working terribly well for Britain. And, and, and the third aspect, which is a much more um, 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 political, geopolitical aspect, was that I felt very uncomfortable with um, some of the things which were going on in parts of the European Union, um, particularly on the eastern fringe of the um, rise of populism. You might say we have that in the, in the UK too now, but there was that its aspects and um, um, as somebody of Hungarian extraction, I was particularly perturbed by the, the rise of the um, anti-Semitism anti in Hungary, um, the um, the attacks on George Soros and so on. Um, generally, the problems across um, that part of Eastern Europe, um, and I began to feel this wasn't a very comfortable place to be. And and you you begin to feel feel that the impact of some of the Euro areas economic policies, um, in particular, if you looked at unemployment levels, particularly in the southern tier of Europe um, and in parts of Eastern Europe, um, 
um, they were um, a direct reflection really of some of the policies which were um, really um, attractive for the northern tier, the, 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 the hardworking northern tier of the European Union, but weren't really working for the broader um, benefit. So those were the kind of arguments which I wanted to bring in, in terms of the economic background. And then I began to think about the things which Europe, Britain was good at. So if we leave the European Union, how will we prosper? What will we be good at? So um, <laughs> and one of the curiosities of the, um, of the debate, and it's a debate which is still going on in terms of the trade agreement, which is now being negotiated at, at the present time between the um, European Union and, and, and the current government, the Johnson government, um, is how little attention is paid to the things that we're really good at. So the um, so we're spending all this time on fishing, not point, not point. I want it, whatever the percentage is, not point, not not one of percent of the of Britain's GDP. Um, quite a lot of time on industrial subsidies, which is a, a quite interesting area because um, um, we seem to have been much keener on behaving well around subsidies than some of the other European Union countries have done. But we weren't really talking about what we were really good at. And I identified in my own mind a whole series of areas um, which I thought were really quite interesting. And I think um, um, as we go into the pan as we've gone through the pandemic, I think one of the ones which um, which is really timely is that you know I did have a good look at R and D and the pharmaceutical sector in particular. I spent some time I mean, Cambridge with um, AstraZeneca, um, and so there's quite a lot of AstraZeneca. There's quite a bit around around there what they've been doing in science and, and so on. And I've spent some time with GSK too, so the other big pharmaceutical companies. And and we've seen during this pandemic that whereas Public Health England at, at times has looked has looked to have difficulties and so on, it was only when the private sector has really stepped in and stepped up to the plate, and the universities have stepped up to the plate. Um, um, all the all the major research universities, um, UCL, um, UCL, um, Imperial, Oxford, Cambridge, Southampton has played a very big role in all of this. That things began to look a bit better. So the um, so you know the the best of the therapeutic treatments came out of has come out of Southampton University has a seventy percent um, effectiveness. It comes out of a small company which was spun out of. Um, the labs at the University of Southampton into their science park into a small public company. The shares of that company have gone up 700, 700 or 7,000% um, since the book was written. Um, but um, 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 it, was a, it was a can do attitude of our R&D and our science and our pharmaceuticals. And of course, we've had the news in the last, in recent days about um, AstraZeneca and, it, and its vaccine, which looks like it'll be the one which most of us get. We called 100 million doses, and um, providing it can get through the next series of regulatory hoops, it'll be out with us quite soon, um, and is more easily administered in many ways than some of the um, the other vaccines which require cooling and so on. Um, so um, I'm very upbeat about the work which has been done in our universities, and you know, Jonathan. Jonathan's University is among those universities which has a great reputation around the world. Very upbeat about the work that they've done, and um, and particularly in these science and research-based areas. And a lot of good technology, science, pharmaceutical drugs, and so on, are coming out of that brain power. Now, um, I'll I'll defend myself before somebody attacks me about this. I'll say, well, what's going to happen when you lose the science funds from the European Union and um, and you detract from bring, pulling in the scientists from around the world in the way that we have done. And that, you know, that is going to be an issue. And obviously we need to, those science, the government, you know, which is now very financially constrained, the UK government will need to think very carefully before it, um, um, it if it's not that it does what it promised to do, which is to replace those, that funding for R&D. And our R&D percentage, by the way, I think there's a piece yesterday, there's been a piece Recently in the newspapers, in the Times, I read something by Sam Laidlaw, former head of Centrico, who, um, former oil tycoon, who heads something called uh, a government advisory body on R&D and science and technology. And he said that you know, we need to get, make sure that those percentages are brought up to the right OECD levels. And I couldn't agree more with that. And I think I say that in, somewhere in the book. I think we, we deal with that. The other sectors I wanted to focus on, um, um, having dealt, dealt with science, I mean, I mentioned the creative sector. Um, we tend to, 
um, you know, we tend to think of um, Britain as a services economy, but um, you know, when we're a services economy, we're not just haircuts and um, coffee shops, although as important as haircuts, and you can see my hair's getting slightly out of place at the moment, and coffee shops are obviously very important as well, and so on, but then we've heard a lot about the hospitality industry in the, during this whole COVID crisis. But uh, you know, if you step back, you know, the, 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 the creative sector of the UK economy, and I think um, some work done by the Creative Industries um, Federation um, research works, good quality research done by, by them. Um, you, know, you can, I'm sure people will challenge it, but they, they, they would argue that it's something like eight, nine percent of the UK GDP, GDP is gener generated by this sector. And so we need to get behind the sector. We need to have much more training in that sector. Um, interesting enough, you know, the, the very courses which my own newspaper over the years has attacked, media, media training courses, sports, sports science courses, and so on, those are actually bedrock courses for some of these creative industries, which we've done very well with. So I actually, you know, I'm in dispute with the, um, the general editorial policy of the paper, which has always been kind of, Regarded such courses as you know out of the out of the out of the order. In fact, one of my sons um, did something called creative IT at university, and that's been a very very good background for him for a reasonably successful career in film production, video production, which he's still involved in and has managed to keep involved in right through lockdown. Um, I'm pleased to say. Um, but yeah, we, when I say creative, we have to, we cast the net very widely, and I cast the net net very widely as, as the Creative Industries Association does. So it takes in architecture, design, fashion, and things we don't even think about, such as, you know, um, that, you know, one, one of the interesting things about Jaguar Rover is that it was run by a designer and design um, in their cars and on their website and everything about what they do is very design led. And that's, you know, a very important part of what industry does in this country, you know, the, the design quality. Of course, UK architecture um, is everywhere around the world. It's at the new um, African Heritage Museum in Washington, DC, on the Mall, which is the most popular museum there at these days when it's open. Um, can't get tickets even when it, when, when it is open. And under normal circumstances, you can't get tickets in there unless you book weeks in advance. The architecture of the... Of the um, Bundestag in, German, in Berlin and so on. These are all great British architectural monuments, the Pompidou Centre going back a bit and so on. Um, and so there's a lot of, and um, you know, these partnerships, um, architectural partnerships have had you know, great traction around the world and it's part of the design sector, I would say. We've also got, um, and then there's more obvious examples. I, I, I use a lot of JK Rowling in the book. Um, um, she seems to be a slightly um, um, con controversial figure at the moment because of um, uh, arguments about um, about sexual equality and so on. But um, 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 but she um, you know she's a one person, and I happen to be friendly with her um, her agent who happens to be a, a, on the serve on the charity which I work work with too. And her, and you know he he employs 104 people um, at his agency, of which he tells me 102 are employed on her account alone um, because of her worldwide um, ability to generate income for the UK in all sorts of ways, ranging from uh, Broadway shows, obviously, to actually book publications and so on. So it's, um, and then the, the, the musical examples are Dale and Ed Sheeran and the more kind of edgy examples such as Stormzy, um, all of whom are good, um, um, in many ways, good adverts for Creative Britain in all sorts of ways. So I do that that particular sector, and and one which you know, um, which um, Andrew knows much more than, about than I do, and um, um, and Jonathan as well, which is probably the financial sector, which I'm fascinated by, and obviously core what I do every day is write about the financial sector, and you know I. Um, I was a bit wrong about this because I thought it would be unaffected um, by Brexit. It obviously has been affected. Um, um, we've, we, it, the government, successive governments actually, have, or successive administrations, haven't really got to, never really got to grips with the, the need for a passport, a European passport, and um, uh, mutual recognition 
and uh, many of those arguments which were first um, were brought up during the referendum campaign. So um, we've lost a bit. Um, I don't know, um, 10,000, I think um, EY monitors this. They've got some quite good data. Um, I think they, they, are, they say 10,000 jobs have gone. Um, when I visit, you know, when I visited before lockdown, dinners at, at, at Goldman's and um, JP Morgan, um, um, Jamie Dimon was in London about it, about just before earlier this late last year or early this year I can't quite remember and he had a, a small briefing for financial jet for finance, finance editors and he was quite negative about um, how London was going to lose over time and so I've explored a bit of that and explore what might take its place um, and I do think that you know there is a case to be made and I try to make it in the book probably make it too strongly some people will say um, that um, you know um, that you know, Britain, the, the city of London has been through all sorts of traumas going right back to the um, Great Fire of London, if you like. Um, and, um, and it's been through very bad periods and been very good through very good periods. I think it was virtually moribund um, um, just after the First World War. Um, in fact, the Daily Mail, um, believe it or not, um, and I think this is in a, a book um, written by one of your predecessors about, um, or somebody who worked, somebody at King's, um, um, who wrote who wrote about this? Um, Daily Mail actually was the only place where you could trade shares um, for a couple of years after after the um, First World War. Um, um, can, can I, I ask? For, yeah, have I talked for too long? And so, yeah, and I, I think I then there's the, then there's what been, the government's yeah. doing right and what the government's doing wrong. What they're doing now, right and wrong. Hmm. Well, I think that that they haven't. You know, they in this in these negotiations which are going on at the moment, I mean, you know, they've got a very full plate. I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I have some sympathy. I mean, I, I know this government is not, has been incredibly poor at delivering what they promised in terms of testing and tracing and PPE and the wastage is just absolutely horrendous. Um, but I, you know, I would say that, that you know, the, the bandwidth um, of dealing with a, with a pandemic um, and some rather rusty financial, some rather rusty state institutions. And I think the NHS, um, which we all worship and clap our hands about and so on, hasn't had a great war really in many ways. Um, um, even though the people who work in this have done, had a great war because they're brave and and put themselves through dangers. What the, so I think that, that you know they're they're they're, tr they're trying hard. And, you know, if you go back to the vaccines, which I talked about before. Um, you know, the person who ordered the vaccines, Kate Bingham, was taking a bit of um, taking a bit of pain for um, being um, the person who, um, what's the word, um, has has too close connections to the Tory party. Probably right. Married to um, a minister doesn't help. Look, sorry, yeah, I want to know. Yeah. Get get beyond the COVID yes. uh, crisis. What in terms of industrial policy is the government doing right? What in terms of industrial policy going forward is the government doing wrong? Well, it's, 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 so it's done one. So it's not done a huge amount is the answer yet. Um, I think, as I understand it, and I've talked to the trade, the business secretary about this, and as I understand it, they have a new technological strategy which will come out before Christmas, which is to get behind some of these te te technology industries and put some weight behind them to change the goals because the previous industrial strategy just wasn't good enough and wasn't thorough enough. I think that they've, you know, part of that strategy has been this, um, the new national security um, uh, arrangements around the, uh, around foreign takeovers, which are parallel really to what has already, is already in place in the United States, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, what they have in France and so on, where they've drawn the, where they've drawn the sectors much more widely, although we have actually embraced 17 different sectors. So um, um, there is a chance to intervene. So I think that's, I actually think that that scrutiny, I, you know, I, I began by talking about um, how, I, how I was concerned about our national economic security in terms of foreign takeovers and so on. I think this might take care of some of that. I mean, you know, some very foolish decisions taken in the last couple of years. So um, at the moment, we're trying to do something around satellites, you know, have our own satellite capacity and so on. But we had two satellite champions in the UK, um, um, both of which are now um, out of our hands. They're in private equity or overseas hands. Um, that's the Cobham um, and so on. So some of the technology is here in the UK, but command and control and 
a lot of the um, technology expertise is, is now elsewhere. And you know, that, that's, a worry. so that's a worrying thing. So I think that's a good thing. I, I think where the big neglect has been has been around the financial sector. And I've written, we've written in the paper quite widely about this, about the concerns in the city representative bodies about this. Um, um, but you know, you, you, I imagine that the thinking in government is, this is a very strong sector. It's very resilient. It's got through many problems before, and it will bounce back. But it's a bit of it's a bit of seat of your pants, I think. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Um, okay. Well, yeah, look, that, I've talked for that a long time. Yeah, Jonathan, what uh, what is the government getting right? What is the government getting wrong? And are Alex's prescriptions for the government and in, for Britain's industry in general, or its its economic base, right or, or misguided? Well, let me start by saying that uh, I mean, you tried to set this up a bit as, as me uh, um, disagreeing with Alex, but um, I'll start off by saying that there is a lot to agree with in, in this book. And in particular, um, you know, the, uh, as you say, and as Alex said, this is an optimistic take on Britain's strengths and where we go from here after Brexit. Um, and I genuinely think that we do need that. We are, we do tend to be rather down on ourselves. Uh, we've been down on ourselves, perhaps on both sides, a bit since Brexit. Um, and we've been down on ourselves um, with some justification during COVID in that, that neither the economic, you know, that the, the, uh, um, the, the response has not been, uh, particularly from a health perspective, has been far from optimal. Um, but this country economically has a huge number of strengths. And I think Alex does an excellent job um, in this book of getting under the skin of, of some of those strengths in some of the areas where the UK has done well historically um, and has the potential to do well in future after Brexit. Um, and I think that, that you know, in, in particular, that the identification and the discussion here of those sectors where we do have strengths and making the point that um, services, um, and, and you know this as, as well as anyone, Andrew, but you know, we do tend to uh, talk about the UK economy as if the service sector was, on the one hand, um, finance in the city, and on the other hand, hairdressers and pubs. And I think Alex does an excellent job of explaining that it is so much more um, in terms of everything from uh, the creative sector to the university sector to R&D and pharmaceuticals. Um, to accountants, architects, uh, um, uh, design, advertising, all of that. Um, that is really where, um, uh, where we are successful at the moment and where if we want a high productivity, high scale, high wage economy in the future, um, we need to work out how we are successful in those areas. And I think, as I said, I think this is, um, the, the book does an, an excellent job of giving both a, a detailed picture uh, um, of, of those sectors and why we're good at them um, and explaining why uh, that gives us some cause for optimism in the future. I, I'll try not to talk too much about Brexit because in some sense it, it's slightly you know, behind us at this point. We sort of know where, where we're going. Um, I think uh, the book is, is much less convincing in explaining you know, what, what is going to change for the better as a consequence of Brexit. Um, because, uh, and, and this I think is, is something one, one perennially finds uh, um, with, with advocates of Brexit from the, uh, um, um, who are uh, liberal on economic issues as it were, or, or, uh, um, which is, well, what exactly are these things that, that we could do outside of the EU that we couldn't do inside? How is Brexit going to be better for pharmaceuticals or architecture? Uh, um, outside than inside. Um, and I've never really seen a convincing case for this, and I certainly don't see it in this book. And I think it is revealing, and I think something I, I'd be quite interested to hear from Alex is, that uh, you talk to people in these sectors, um, whether it's pharmaceuticals, um, whether it's uh, uh, um, advertising, whether it's uh, um, uh, uh, architecture, certainly in the creative industries, and you will find that um, the vast, vast majority of them, and particularly people at senior levels, voted to keep us in the EU. Now, to some extent, that may be cultural. People in the arts may just be inclined that way. But why is it um, that particularly people in high productivity, I haven't even mentioned 
research in academia and universities. Why is it that people in precisely the high, high productivity service sector are clearly those people who are most likely to have voted to stay in the EU? They clearly didn't think that what was stopping them being successful and growing was EU membership. Now, it may be that there, as I say, there are other reasons, and it may be that EU membership was not, is not essential for them to succeed. And certainly we must all hope that it isn't essential for them to succeed. But it clearly wasn't the case that collectively they thought that there were these great opportunities which were being precluded um, by, uh, by EU membership. Um, and I think that brings me on to, to industrial policy and where, uh, um, where we go for here, what our strategy for our, our, the sector is. And I think it is quite revealing as uh, um, um, Anand Menon, my colleague here at the UK and it changed in Europe at King's and I wrote about uh, these, these issues about state aid, subsidy, protection from foreign takeovers, that bizarrely, um, it seemed as if the main motivation for some people in the um, Brexit current negotiations with the EU around things like state aid level playing field was uh, as if we wanted to leave the European Union, so that we could be more French. Um, and indeed, Alex did man mention as a positive example um, French attitudes towards foreign takeovers. And France, of course, famously uh, um, uh, tried to block uh, a takeover of Danone on the grounds that yogurt was a key strategic industry for France. Um, and when uh, um, Alex talks about, uh, I think Unilever probably do make yogurt, among other things. But it, uh, he talks about Unilever. Ice, cre ice cream, I think. Um. Ice cream. Um, and the implication there is that, that uh, ice cream is a, uh, a key strategic uh, um, industry for the UK. Um, and so leaving Brexit behind, forget about that. Go into this question of, well, what does our industrial policy and industrial strategy look like uh, um, uh, uh, um, inside or outside and uh, outside now of, of, of the EU? Um, and uh, I think... Here, it's important to recognize that a lot of what Alex is saying is, I think, now mainstream in some sense. The, in, you know, we, there was a period of um, about uh, 25 years, 25 to 30 years, when industrial strategy was really a dirty word in this country. Um, it was, um, you know, the failures of the 60s and the 70s um, meant that it was uh, discredited. And of course, um, Mrs. Thatcher uh, um, regarded it as anathema, even though she might occasionally have, have, have uh, um, resorted to it on, on some occasions. But basically, it was anathema. And it was resuscitated um, in the uh, um, early to mid 2000s, essentially by Peter Mandelson. And I think it's quite interesting. We've had a, this huge political turbulence of the last 10 years, with, um, you know, or 15 years, with, with governments of different parties and different complexions, uh, even within. Conservative Party governments of different complexions. And yet, there's actually a pretty clear continuity of industrial strategy development running from Mandelson under Brown through Vince Cable in the coalition, through a succession of Conservative Secretaries of State to the last version of the industrial strategy, um, which I think, and it reflects, you know, the, the views of, of, of a lot of economists and what you might call the sense of ground uh, um, from people like Vicky Price, who you mentioned earlier, people are, and, and now drawing on some of the uh, um, the ideas of Mariano Mazzucato, who you mentioned favorably in the book. Um, so there's actually quite, quite a lot of consensus uh, uh, around this, I think, uh, across the um, political spectrum and across the spectrum of economics. Um, and the, the trick really, I think, uh, um, is, is doing it, is first of all, implementation um, and, and doing what has been set out, doing it well. Um, and that will test the capacity of the British state um, and the British civil service. Um, and I think, you know, there's a slight worry here in that, again, that, you know, it's hard to see Brexit as a positive here. Um, not so much because of the policy aspects of Brexit, but just because Brexit has has strained the British state, has put pressure, as Alex says in, in the book, on, on governance, has put stress on the civil service, has been distracting, um, and uh, um, may do so going forward. But perhaps the sort of key elements are, well, can we, can we do this well? We have not had the self-confidence to do it well in the future, are we confident that we will actually be able to, if not pick winners all the time, because you can't pick winners all the time, but 
to have a better track record in picking winners and rejecting losers in the future than we were in the 1960s and 70s. And I think that, you know, that, that, that's a hard question. I agree with Alex that it is the right thing. I, I, you know, I, I would broadly share the consensus view that doing something along these lines is, is the right thing to do. Um, but we shouldn't, shouldn't imagine that, that setting out strategies is enough. Actually, the, the implementation, the following it up with setting priorities, with being rigorous about evaluating what we're good at and what we're not and what we, can, what we should be funding and what we can't um, um, is, is going, to be, um, going to be really hard. And um, I, I, I am not so confident the examples of the last five years. I mean, Alex mentioned the uh, um, uh, procurement issues during COVID. That doesn't give you uh, a huge sense of, set of con- a huge amount of confidence in, in our current ability to do this well. Um, I, I hope it will change, and uh, but but we'll see. Um, finally, I just like you know. I, I mean, I think uh, you quoted right at the beginning, uh, um, Andrew, uh, um, the two endorsements uh, of um, uh, of Alex's book from uh, from Vicky Price, my former colleague at the uh, Government Economic Service, um, and from uh, David Goodhart, um, and. Uh, that's interesting because in some sense it's a little bit worrying in that David and Vicky are hardly on the same page. And Vicky is very much uh, um, uh, like me, a, uh, um, an economic liberal, strongly in favor of, the, of free trade um, and um, as liberal, as politically feasible an immigration policy as you could want. Um, strongly in favour, as you mentioned, Alex, of, of, of uh, um, maximising the value of our high, te- uh, high productivity service sector, of attuning our education system to that, of indeed through the sorts of uh, uh, um, university courses that you mentioned. David is quite the other on quite the, you know, is, is a um, uh, um, much more conservative in, on social uh, uh, Issues and conservative economically, not in the sense of being more right wing, but in the sense of being more uh, um, more statist, um, less open, more protectionist in in certainly in terms of immigration and uh, um, and to some extent in other respects, more less keen on university education and more keen on uh, vocational and technical education, more less keen as as in his new book on uh, on meritocracy um, and. So the real question to me is, well, which way do you go on those? Are you more with Vicky and, and perhaps me or more with David? Uh, um, uh, because that, uh, you know, that is a tension that you observe in this current government as well. Um, so that's probably enough for me. I, I probably, I hope, given you enough uh, questions. As I said, I mean, I, I enjoyed uh, reading this book uh, now, now twice. Um, and uh, uh, um, I, I do think it is a, a needed um charge of optimism about the British economy, um, but we shouldn't pretend that any of this is going to be easy. Over to you. Okay, there you are. That, that, that last question, Vicky Price or David Goodhart, which way do you, which way do you swing, as it were? Uh, well, you probably think I, I probably swing both ways. <laughs> um, I'm, 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 as you probably can ascertain from the book, I'm much more of an economic liberal than I am in the David Goodhart camp. And indeed, um, I think, you know, Jonathan and I, once clashed, I think, around it, the immigration issue or the papers, the, my papers um, um, attitude towards immigration. But actually, I'm as far as immigration is concerned, I think it's a you know really important. And you know, I, I'm a, I'm an approver of immigration. As a son of an immigrant, I find it very hard to um, to uh, to be anti-immigration. So I think you know great skills and great and great energy is brought into the economy. Um, through immigration. So David Goodhart and I would presumably um, 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 part company. I think where, you know, Jonathan and I are really actually on the same page in many ways is, is my concerns and about this particular government we have at the moment about its bandwidth and its ability really to, and I used that word before, I think, um, so I'm repeating myself, but, but this ability to to it can announce policies, but its ability yeah, but to follow them through. About the government, are you talking about the government or the civil service? I think I think you know, the, um, David uh, Jonathan will be much more informed on this than I will. But I mean, it's the inability really of of ministers to to turn 
ideas and policies into events on the facts on the ground. And I think we, you know, and I, I go back to the, you know, the previous, um, you know, the May administration, um, it was um, that that particular government produced an industri- quite an interesting industrial strategy, but so little of anything ever happened. I mean, it was just like a, a manifesto, which nobody acted upon. It might as well have not been there. They were obviously consumed at the time with Brexit. The current government is consumed with COVID. But you really worry that some of the re- things which really need to be done, um, the real transformations which need to be done, and um, the changes we need to endorse in, in the university system and so on, uh, and, and the governance changes which needs to take place, um, will ever get done um, because of because they never seem to be governments don't seem to be able to lift themselves out of the crisis into a into a longer term strategy but they are talking about big institutional change they're talking about setting up new agencies to to foster technology um, um, and innovation and science and so on and and you know they're talking about more regional diversification of um, of the way things are done and so on. So there are some quite good ideas out of there, but execution and determination. Um, I also think that they, that, and, and this is very strange, I think, and you know, um, is that although Boris Johnson, um, you know, everyone is a kind of big, bold talker, he hasn't yet managed to capture an image of what Britain will look like after, a vision of what Britain will look like after these these after these times have passed what what the new britain is going to be the global britain is going to be um and and i hark back right into the past on this because somehow harold wilson all those years ago did actually as a labor prime minister did actually have a vision now the vision you know the national enterprise board and so on some of this stuff is now becoming quite fashionable again <laughs> Um, um, so you had a vision and you know, new, de- new department of economic affairs and so on. And uh, that vision didn't, you know, it turned out to be a disaster because of the pound and external factors and the sterling balances and all sorts of stuff we've all forgotten about, which, which are past history after the Thatcher era, I think. Um, but um, um, this government doesn't, hasn't managed to capture that image and the, you know, it's that, that, that vision. And, um, I just, and I, I don't quite know why, why that is, because that's something which you'd, you'd hope that they would have. Just going back to one other point, just to answer Jonathan's other uh, point. You're right, Jonathan, you know, that there weren't a lot of chief executives who I talked to who, who supported, publicly supported Brexit. And indeed, as I said earlier on, um, um, the harshest criticism I've had of the book is from one um, current FTSE 100 chief executive who was on one of these calls um, and did give me a very hard time over it. Um, however, I would say this, I do talk to these people all of the time in the course of my work. They're not my friends, but you know, they, they have need for me. They want to get their share prices higher. And so they, they, you know, they, they make time. I've booked in two calls already today from different chief executives who want to have a chat about various things. So um, this happens all the time. Um, what they say in public and what they said in private or what they did in private are two very different things. So if you talk to, and I don't want to put any particular chief executive, talk to some of our, two or three of our biggest global companies. They're right up there in the top 10 of the FTSE. I'm, I'm talking about consumer goods companies, largely fast moving consumer goods companies. They, you know, they would say to you, Alex, you know, um, um, you know, we were comfortable enough inside the European Union, but actually to us and to our companies, it makes not as, a bit as any difference at all whether we're in or out we we went global a long time ago unilever earn you know earns more than 60 percent of its income outside the european outside the european more, out, out, in emerging markets not not just outside the european 90 percent of his income comes from outside britain um, um or outside you um but most of it is in emerging markets in north america um they don't need they don't you know and so as far as I can say, it doesn't really make a jot of difference really to that. And I think it's the same with Diageo, the, you know, the spirits company. Um, it's the same with the pharmaceutical companies. I mean, um, it's, a, um, it's quite interesting to reflect that AstraZeneca, which has been in the news in the last few days, earns 20% of its income in China. It is Britain's biggest, most successful company in China. Um, so, you know, let me, let me yeah. push you on this. Let me push Jonathan on it. I mean, Brexit's in the past, right? 
But there is something going on. And, and Alex's point about the white heat of technology and Wilson trying to set up a new economic model. Well, and to some extent, that was what Dominic Cummings was trying to do. He was trying to drill down into the civil service so that changes at the government level would actually be implemented by a changed mindset, a changed culture within the civil service. And yet we've dumped the one, the, the one person who's been executed, as it were, is Dominic Cummings. Was he actually on onto something? in terms of trying to change the, 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 the machinery of government so they could deliver what the politicians wanted? Um, well, I think, I mean, uh, uh, I, I do think he was on to something. And, you know, I had some sympathy in particular with um, Dominic's view that uh, um, there was um, not enough quantitative, scientific and technical expertise in the civil service, too many generalists, too many people with classics degrees. Um, I always thought it was hilarious that that Dominic's uh, um, criticisms of the sort of people who ran and why it was a total disaster could have been written to uh, to be uh, about Boris Johnson. You know, people who done who were good at writing speeches um, and had probably done a classics degree at Oxford. Um, but were entirely superficial and wouldn't know what a standard deviation uh, was or, or um, what sampling error was. Um, and uh, as a mathematician myself, originally, I had a lot of uh, sympathy with that. Um, uh, I also though, think that uh, um, Alex is right that, it, you know, ultimately a lot of this comes from a uh, um, ministerial Level, you know, you get you know, civil service is reasonably good at delivering what ministers want. If ministers are clear, consistent, and work at it, as opposed to simply making one announcement today and then wandering off to the next thing. Um, so uh, uh, there is uh, there is certainly a lot that could be done to make the British civil service more uh, um, uh, um, more uh, rigorous, uh, statistically and scientifically literate. Um, and able to deliver. Um, and I do have, uh, I, I'm not sure whether Cummings went about that the right way, but I do have some sympathy with that. And of course, that's something that goes back to uh, the Fulton Report, uh, you know, at the, uh, of, of the 1960s. So this is not new by, uh, by, by any means, these deficiencies with the, with, with, with the UK civil service. Um, how you change that, or whether this government is, is well positioned, particularly given how it's, how it, that it's made its best efforts to alienate um, people within the civil service, uh, sadly, I think is... Uh, you, you have to, do you have to change it? Do you have to change it to make Britain the global Britain that uh, Alex is talking about, to take advantage of any opportunities that do come up, whether or not you think Brexit was a good idea or a disaster? Mm. Well, I think certainly to, you know, when Alex talks about the, the industrial strategy having lots of good things and, and very slow on implementation, and, you, uh, um, uh, you know, he's, he's right, and, and you need... Um, you need both ministerial drive and resolve and consistency, and you need a civil service that is capable of delivering and capable of making reasonably good decisions reasonably quickly. I mean, it's not, you know, you don't need necessarily to be Singapore, right, where they pay, um, where the best people go into, some of the best people go into the civil service, they pay them private sector salaries, i.e. five times what we pay our civil servants, and they assess them very, very rigorously and make sure they're the best. That would be nice to do that. It's not going to happen here, sadly. Uh, but you don't need that. Um, having, a, you know, just just improving the average quality and speed uh, would uh, would go a long way, I think. But the government, the civil service will not resist regionalization. I mean, you don't feel that there is a kind of, uh, as it were, a centralizing, a centripetal uh, attraction to in the civil service the blob, as, as some people call it. Well, well, I think, I mean, there's certainly uh, um, an extent to which the civil service is London-centric. There's no doubt about that. And, uh, you know, I, I, um, I could not deny that that was, that was true of me. You know, I, I was uh, I spent in London. Um, uh, um, and uh, uh, that part of doing this needs to, you know, you need to improve the, uh, the you need to improve the quality of, of, of public servants outside of London, to do that, of course, you need to devolve powers out of London because people aren't going to go and, and, and work outside of London unless they're actually doing something that they think actually makes a difference. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting to contrast, you know, if you contrast the, the UK with Scotland, the Scotland, you know, I think has, in that sense, it seems to me, devolution has been clearly successful. You have a, 
high caliber for the most part civil service in Scotland. You have the sense that decisions that matter are actually being taken there. So it's worthwhile to stay there and work there. Um, and they have they have uh, they have control over large amounts of expenditure and policy, and they have I think a better relationship um, with uh, um, with, with um, civil society in a variety of forms. That doesn't mean Scotland's this sort of wonderful Scandinavian utopia by any means. Um, but if we could recreate some of that um, public culture. Um, elsewhere in England, I think it would would go uh, w- w- would be a major step forward. I think we've seen, haven't we, um, Jonathan, with the um, you know the elected mayors, some of them, you know, um, Andy Street in the Midlands, yep. Andy Burnham in Scot in in the Ma- Greater Manchester area. I'm told uh, my colleague, um, she's not here in the office mm-hmm. with me at the moment, by my colleague Ruth Sunderland, who comes from Middlesbrough, tells me that the mayor of the Middles, uh, who covers her area, is very innovative, very good, brought in all sorts of new industries into the area. So there are some little sparks out there yes. of, of devolution, but we need, but we, but but it's not good enough, is it? And we ha- and we don't have enough democratic controls over it, and and we and they don't. And you're right, but I wonder. Just this is just a, a question, really. I, you sort of wonder that you know, there's all the talk about COVID and the COVID effect on the economy is that people actually have suddenly decided that London isn't necessarily, living in London and working in London isn't necessarily the best thing in the world. So this might be a, a good moment to try and attract people to, to different parts of the country, good people to different parts of the country to, to take part you know, and bring people who come north, come, from, come south from the north back to where they came from to, to try and take things forward. It, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how you do that, but... Um, it might be an opportunity, you, you sort of think. Yeah. Um, I mean, we don't, we, we treasury, don't know, I think. The Treasury itself has, it, has it, it's, they are going to move some of their staff, aren't they, North? But we don't know where they're going, do we? Um, but, I don't think we know where they're going and we don't know what functions will I No, no, that's true. Um, and I mean, you do have to do this well. I mean, you know, yeah. as you may recall, the uh, the move of the Office of National Statistics to, uh, um, to New York, um, was a uh, um, was sadly under Gordon Brown um, was was a, a bit of a disaster, frankly, and it took the ONS several years to rebuild the capability that it lost because it lost most of its senior staff. Um, so uh, I mean, I'm not uh, opposed at all, but you have to think carefully about how you do this and make sure that you're you're doing it in a way that that that, that works. Yeah. The private sector moves people around willy nilly. Um, the public sector gave people a choice. The private sector wouldn't have given them that choice. Shouldn't the public sector be a little bit tougher on the people who work for it? Oh, no, I don't think people in the ONS had a choice. That's why so many of them left. But it's not hard to get a job as a statistician. If you're a good statistician, it's not hard to get a job, right? Um, uh, you, and, and, you know, and a, a job in London that pays you better than as a civil servant, even if it may not, even if you quite enjoyed being a civil servant. So, so, so a lot, they lost a lot of good statisticians. Um, and, so, you know, remember people in the treasury are people who have outside, op- you know, if, if you're in the treasury and you're any good, um, and you're told you're moving to somewhere in the North, um, you will, you know, it's not a question of, oh, yes, I have no choice. I'm going to pick up and move. It's, well, do I want, to, you know, yes, if I want to, but if I don't, you know, there's, there are other jobs there, right? Yeah, so we're in London because we're in London and you can't really break the, the, the attraction of the great when. Well, I, I mean, you know, it, it, I, I, I'm, I, London is very resilient. Um, so, you know, I have no problem with trying to reduce the relative attractive strength and attractiveness of London. And I think it, it's certainly worth trying. And I certainly think Alex is right. That, you know, this might be an opportunity to try and strengthen our regional economies. I don't think London is going to curl up and die by any means, even if, if somewhat fewer of us come somewhat less of the time to offices in central London. I have- I, I experienced when I first began in journalism the, the pull of London because at the time the Guardian had only recently moved to London mm-hmm. and it still it still operated its foreign department its foreign affairs department and most of it and lots of its re- general news reporting out of Manchester sports reporting and all so, sorts of other stuff and I and you know within ten years or fifteen years the, the gravity of London had pulled everybody 
into London. They were left with a, a nub of an office in, in a, a small core office in, in Manchester, which was only there because of the history of the paper. And of course, it's now gone altogether. Um, it's broken off that total. But you see that the pull of London, so reversing that is, extraordinary, is an extraordinary, right. extraordinarily hard thing to do. But you're right about Scotland. Um, so I, in the book, actually, I mentioned Dundee because Dundee is quite interesting. So in my mind, and I don't know Dundee at all, but in my mind, Dundee is all about fruitcakes and the Beano because the Beano, um, um, DC Thompson. Thompson is based in Dundee, which is the, the owner of the owner of the Beano brand. It doesn't exist as a comic anymore. Mm. But um, you know, during, what what I discovered when writing the book was that it is also the centre now of the gaming industry, and Britain is a a huge force in gaming. I mean, it's a multi-billion pound export industry gaming, and and Grand Theft Auto um, has was created in Dundee, and in fact, it's one of the great centres of of gaming. So you can create these centres of excellence outside of Ireland. Simple as that. All right. I want you, we, we, we're coming to the end, but I want you just to put yourself three or four years in the future. What would you like to see the government do between now and then to take advantages of the opportunities that may or may not arise? And also tell us whether you think there's any chance that this will actually happen. First of all, Jonathan. Um, so uh, I, I do think that actually following through on the generally quite sensible um, policy set out in the industrial strategy um, uh, would, you know, I actually think that after 10 years, we are at the point where we have developed this, 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 that it's actually quite good. There's a lot of really good stuff in there um, that if followed through um, would actually begin to make a, 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 a positive difference. So following through and actually having ministers who, and civil servants who buckled down and got, got on with it would be um, a major step forward. Um, and in particular, um, you know, we have the, there was, I think, an open question during most of the time Alex was writing this book as to whether the government was genuinely committed, whether particularly under Boris Johnson, the government was genuinely committed to the net zero target and to decarbonization. For better or for worse, I think that Johnson has clearly gone, made his decision on that. Um, and so we, we are committed to that. And having made that commitment, whether or not you think it's right, we really need to make it work and take, the, uh, uh, take advantage of the opportunities there. And I think, again, what the government set out last week was actually a pretty good start, but it is going to take a hell of a lot of work. Making every car, new car in the UK electric from 2030 requires a national network of uh, national infrastructure of charging points. And at the same time, it requires a huge increase in renewable energy production because we have to produce all this electricity to charge the car. So that in itself is an industrial strategy and a half. So actually buckling down and getting these things done, putting the resources, putting the manpower and woman power behind it, uh, um, generating the bandwidth and not being distracted by other things, those would be, I think, my priorities. What about the, the city? I mean, Rishi Sunak's idea is that the city will grow as a centre, as you say, of green, of green finance. Is green finance a, an appropriate foundation for a new city? Well, I don't think, I mean, I think, you know, the, the city is, the city will, um, as, as Alex said, I think lose some business as a consequence of Brexit, but it is hugely resilient. Um, and, you know, the city is not going to go away. Um, green finance is one thing that we'll be doing over the next 10 or 15 years. Other things, particularly in fintech, uh, um, will also come along. So I, I, you know, uh, that, that, that we, we will lose some things from Brexit, but we will also gain from green finance, we'll gain from other things. I'm not terribly worried overall about the future of the city. Um, and I think, you know, actually with the city is one area where, and Alex is right on this, you know, the UK is perfectly capable of regulating itself uh, uh, reasonably well, uh, um, as, as it has done in the past. The city and gaming, um, <laughs> not, not a million miles apart. Alex, the final word is with you. Let me yeah, ask. so I think, I mean, I, I can't disagree with anything Jonathan has just said. Um, I do think R&D, you know, we really must make sure we hit those R&D targets and offer... In, all, you know, in order to get this green agenda done, um, the, the small modular reactors, which Rolls-Royce, which was part of this plan, which we 
which was outlined last week, get behind these technologies, really be serious about it. And, and we may have to put big bucks or big pounds behind it, which is slightly problematical when, we, <laughs> when we're running a deficit of whatever it's going to be this year, 400 billion, maybe more. Um, it's kind of, you know, these, are, these are very hard choices, but these are essential things we've got to do if we're going to, if this going global and leveling up and the green agenda is actually going to work. Well, it's last week we had Randall Ray, the, one of the proponents of modern monetary theory, on, and uh, mm. you know he's the answer to all our problems, isn't he? <laughs> uh, I, I think I think Andy Haldane um, gave his view, view of mon modern monetary theory yesterday. He said it wasn't modern. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't even a theory. <laughs> <laughs> An old joke, incidentally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I thank Alex? Can I thank Jonathan? Can I thank all of you for watching? Many, many thanks.